Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the keynote event of the 2021 Entrepreneur Conference, hosted by the University of Maryland Alumni Association. My name is Jeff Williams. I'm the Managing Director and Chief Outreach Officer at your Alumni Association and the MC for today's fireside chat. Before we get started with today's event, I have a few housekeeping items. This event will be recorded, but don't worry about appearing in the video since all attendee microphones have been muted and videos turned off. Additionally, closed captioning is available by selecting the icon in your task pane. If you have any questions for our speakers, please go ahead and submit them via the chat function and we will try to get to your questions during Q&A. As you know, this event is the keynote session for the second annual Entrepreneur Conference. Over the next three days, we are hosting numerous events and networking opportunities specifically designed to help Terps like you succeed in your startup ventures. Through these programs, we hope that you will connect with resources at UMD to help start or grow your business venture. Learn from alumni and faculty experts to prepare your startup for success. Network with other Terp entrepreneurs, investors, and advisors and form relationships that will help you advance your career and celebrate the achievements of Terp entrepreneurs and learn why UMD has been rated in the top 10 entrepreneurship programs for six consecutive years. Before we begin our program, I would like to thank Vice President of University Relations, Brody Remington, for helping make this conference possible. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you University of Maryland President, Dr. Daryl J. Pines. President Pines is the university's 34th president and a decades-long member of the University of Maryland community. Before becoming president, Dr. Pines led the Department of Aerospace Engineering for four years. He then transitioned to his role as Nariman Favarden Professor of Engineering and Dean of University of Maryland's A. James Clark School of Engineering. He served in the role of Dean for 11 years, leading this engineering school to national recognition and immense growth. Today, President Pines will be joined by Terp alumnus, Ethan Brown, founder of Beyond Meat. Ethan has served as president and chief executive officer and as a member of the board of directors of Beyond Meat since its inception in 2009. He also serves as a director of the Planet Partnership, a joint venture with PepsiCo. Ethan began his career with a focus on clean energy and the environment, working at Ballard Power Systems, a hydrogen fuel cell company. He is the Henry Crown Fellow at the Aspen Institute, and along with Beyond Meat, was the 2018 recipient of the United Nations Highest Environmental Accolade, Champion of the Earth. Ethan holds an MBA from Columbia University, an MPM with a focus on environment from the University of Maryland, and a BA in history and government from Connecticut College. We are incredibly proud of this accomplished Terp and can't wait to hear more from him today. With that, please help me welcome President Pines and Ethan Brown. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you, Ethan. And Great to see you again. My pleasure. And also to be with all of the Terps that are here with us virtually. So as you know, Ethan, I'm a native Californian and I'm sort of always worried about how is the weather out there? And you know, I grew up in the Bay Area, not in Southern California, but I know the weather is great all over the state of California. So how's the weather out there, Ethan? You know, today it's a little overcast where you are because we're near the ocean, but I think a fun fact about uh, your, your terrific president there and, and myself, we both happen to at different times play basketball on the same court in Oakland. And uh, I, guess, uh, and I, I learned there that I had uh, a lot of growth uh, to do as a basketball player <laughs> on that court, pretty tough court. I think we yeah. share that growth problem. Uh, that's why we're, you're a CEO and I'm a president. <laughs> uh, I'm sure are many of our Terps who are listening in who are entrepreneurs. And so I wanna talk about, of course, entrepreneurship since you are now the president and CEO of Beyond Meat. So what does entrepreneurship, Ethan, mean to you? I mean, some people think about it in terms of sort of educational or character trade or perseverance and determination. But what does entrepreneurship mean to Ethan Brown? 
No, thank you for that question. I, you know, I, I first of all, I just am so happy to be here talking to to folks uh, who are interested in entrepreneurship at the University of Maryland. The University of Maryland is incredibly important to me as an institution. You know, I grew up on the edge of the campus. Uh, my father taught there for decades, and and had I been a better basketball player, I would have gone there. Uh, you know, I I, uh, I just think so highly of the school and was very uh, proud to be a graduate of the graduate program there. Um, so for me, it's really around. You know, do you have something inside you that uh, you're connected to that's so strong that it allows you to take higher levels of risk than the average person, right? And if you can find that, if you can tap into that, uh, then you're on your way. And so for me, it was that process of continuing to unpack kind of what did I stand for? What was I about as a person? And then could I align my business interests with that instead of doing something during the day that I cared about? Uh, but it was separate and distinct from from what is my passion, right? And so once I was able to tap into my passion, uh, then you're able to take risk at an outsized level. And you know, you, if you're going to create an extraordinary outcome, you have to put extraordinary inputs in. And it's just a very simple equation in that regard. And so you know, if, if you're, you're just dreaming and not putting the work in or not taking the risk, you're not going to get that outcome. So you got to find something inside of yourself that's going to allow you to push harder. Uh, where others will stop. And that, to me, is the is the defining feature of, a, of an entrepreneur. Yeah, Ethan, you know, Kevin Plank, uh, another great alum like yourself, also said some of the same kinds of things. He talked about passion and, and your really your focus and perseverance and your determination to continue to, to thrive sure. and, and build your business. Uh, however, I want to just take you back a little bit on your journey. As you started your journey uh, way back some years ago, um, if you really understood, you know, things a little bit better, what, what would you remember or how, how would you think about how you began your journey that you wish you knew now, then that you kind of know now? Like what you know now compared to what you knew at that time. Is there something that you learned today that would have informed you in your beginning of your journey in entrepreneurship? Oh, great question. Um, I, for, for me, it, it was a process of overcoming uh, uh, expectations um, within myself uh, about what I should be doing with my life, right? And I was on a career path uh, that was a good one. I was working in energy and I was, I was advancing in that regard. Um, and that kind of could have been it, you know? And I, and I, and I felt like, um, you know, there was something else I really wanted to go do, but it was the, the idea of leaving that sector and kind of getting myself, you know, involved in, you know, powders and proteins and fats in a lab and then in a kitchen was kind of too far afield. And so for years I put it off. And, you know, had I not put it off for, for that much uh, time, I think I could have gotten started even earlier. And so, but, but it was that self-limitation of, this is kind of not where I, yeah, I was headed in my career. And so getting the courage to change and to, to step out of the lane that I was in made all the difference for me. And I guess I wish I'd done it earlier. So you, you now have that courage and you have done it incredibly well. As you know, there's a number of Terps who are students in the audience today, in the virtual audience. And so they're tuning in to hear this advice that you're giving them. So what, what advice for our current students who aspire to be entrepreneurs would you give? Are there certain things that you should do during, or should they do during their college experience to help them? That is internships, volunteering, particular classes, this concept of taking risks? Yeah. I think one, I mean, you're at just one of the best public institutions there is. There's the, 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 the classes that are available to you uh, are broad in, in scope. And, and, uh, and so take advantage of the diversity of courses you can take there because it's, you're, you're entering a world where uh, uh, consilient thinking is, is so important. Uh, and so being able to uh, weave together different disciplines uh, is really important to answering problems. And so don't get too specialized too early. Even if you're going you know, hard toward an engineering degree, make sure you're taking some other courses so you get perspective about some of the challenges you're going to face. Uh, so having that broad base of an education is, is extremely uh, important. I think continuing to um, seek within yourself what's going to drive you through uh, obstacles, what's going to help you move a mountain, uh, it's really important to find out. You know, just because your parents did something or because the you know, career coach you have thinks it might be a good idea, if that's not resonating within your heart, you're going to be leaving on the table something that can really power you through uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a adversity that will come your way. 
And so I think continuing to, to do that introspection is really important. It's hard work. There's a lot of distraction in the world, but the juice it will give you later in your life in terms of building something is, is significant. So get a well-rounded education. Don't be too specialized too early. Uh, and then tie into that inner strength that you'll find when you find your calling. A great, great advice. So you've been a graduate from our institution. You've stayed kind of connected to our university. So how has the University of Maryland and your relationship with the university truly inspired and helped your entrepreneurial journey? I mean, it's been, it's been everything for me. I mean, I, I watched my dad uh, as a professor there do entrepreneurial things. Um, you know, he, uh, he would take courses there. Even as a professor, he took courses on ag, uh, agriculture economics. He's, he's a philosopher, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but I was sitting in all those classes with him as a kid. Uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and just being exposed to the business school there earlier in my life, uh, the policy school, working on environmental policy, um, and then watching other Terps be successful, you know, and the pride that comes with that, with Terrapin pride that you have, you know, it, it's something you want to carry throughout your life. Um, so the, the education I got there was literally the best in the world in terms of what I was focused on, you know, being able to understand climate, being able to understand natural resource uh, utilization and, and the threats to it. Uh, all came through the University of Maryland, and so uh, I've carried that with me. And so if you think about the pillars of my business, um, you know, it's really four things. We focus on human health, we focus on uh, climate, we focus on natural resources, we focus on animal welfare. So much of that was grounded in the experience I had not only growing up around the campus. Like, I used to go to the ag buildings on the campus, and, and you know, they, because of uh, my dad's relationship there, I could go in and see the animals and, 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 and learn about them. I could go watch the great programs that are being built in the basketball arena. And, and I used to be able to sit and practice. And <laughs> as I've shown you many times, I've talked to you about anyway. This right here nice. is a big passion. I'm showing you <laughs> <Really nice>. my <laughs> yeah. I love it. <laughs> but, but just that commitment to excellence, right? Like, yeah. let's be the best. If we're going to be somewhere. Let's be the best. Let's win. You know, uh, something you get through being a Terrapin. Well, I love that model of be the best. That was uh, our Terrapin lacrosse team. We tried to be the best this past weekend. Came just one yeah. point short, but I was very proud of the team. So I, I agree with your Good. philosophy, be the best. We are Terrapin, that's our Terrapin pride. So again, going back to um, your entrepreneurial journey, what is your best advice that you can give to someone out there in the virtual community who has an interest in starting a business just like you? What's your best piece of advice? Yeah, I think uh, what I did that helped me a lot, um, and again, this began at Maryland. I, I can picture myself in the computer lab there. Uh, it marinated in the problem. What are you trying to solve? Like, it, it don't don't have a cursory understanding of it. Become an expert, right? So, so get get uh, identify. You know, as you as you start to narrow, you know, you get that broad education, so you can look at things. You can have that sense of perspective. And once you identify that problem, bring everything you have to bear, what you've learned on understanding that problem better than anyone else. So the, the thing that we have here at Beyond Meat, we, the charge we have to our science and engineers is understand meat better than anyone else in the world. Like that's your job. You have to understand the composition of animal protein better than any, I don't care if they're you're working in meat science for decades. You, if you're gonna build that from plants, you have to understand it better than anyone in the world, right? And so marinating the problem long enough to really bring something novel to it, right? And so that's what I tried to do, was just to gain perspective around what is animal protein? How do you create animal protein? And how, how could you create it possibly without using the animal? But it took a long time, and, and we're blessed to live in an era where information is more available than ever before, right? So I just spent tons of time, got home from work, you know, dealt with the kids, and just read at night on the internet, read every paper I could find, right? So. You know, again, extraordinary outcomes, you got to put in some kind of extraordinary input to get there, and, and that's often work. Well, that's a very great quote. Extraordinary outputs require extraordinary inputs. So people hear that clearly. Extraordinary outputs require extraordinary inputs. An Ethan Brown original quote that I, I'm calling out right now. And so, Ethan, this is amazing because, I mean, just, you know, I, I'm really amazed by your life's journey and your father being so innovative and the fact that you've taken like your entire experience and turned it into this incredible beyond meat. And so I think most folks in our audience were, and you, and you kind of said it a little bit, started talking about this, you know, how do you figure out building a burger that does not rely on cows? How do you do yep. that and go through the scientific studies and get to not only the scientific studies to produce it, 
but the taste and the flavors that the human being is going to have to accept. So how do you do yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate so much the, uh, anyway, your, your uh, um, focus on what I've done and what I'm doing, and, and it's, it's humbling. Um, it really is. I think in part, um, you know, again, I get back to the campus and to the, the system. So when I was quite young, I went and lived down the Y Island, where Maryland has an ag extension uh, uh, program. I just went there for a week, I remember this, but then my family later moved out there in association with the Aspen Institute. And um, but when I was first there, you know, I remember working with the cattle there. I remember working with the cattle on our own farm in the western part of the state. Uh, you begin to understand that there's inputs going into the animal, and those inputs are all plant-based, right? And so, and then you go back to the ag extension system uh, at Maryland itself, where you could literally stick your hand inside of a cow oh. and stomach, right? And you could, and they used to have it on the campus. And so, you begin to understand that there's a process that's occurring where amino acids and, and, and lipids and, and minerals and vitamins are all coming into the animal from plant sources. The animals are using their biology to convert that into muscle, which we then harvest as meat. Uh, but it doesn't start with the animal, right? It starts with the plant. And so all the science and technology we have today, the question we kept asking was, what if you didn't define uh, meat in terms of its origin from coming from a chicken, cow, or pig, but rather you thought about it in terms of its composition, the amino acids, lipids, trace minerals, vitamins, and water. If I'm able to get all those from plants and affect the same assembly that the animal's doing within their body, why do I need to use the animal anymore? And that was the kind of thinking we brought to it and said, how do we do this? And kept asking that question. And then ultimately found some technology that allows us to do that. And I worked very closely with the MIPS program uh, I think I had two, uh, uh, two turns at that, which is just an amazing uh, program with Ronnie over there at GIST, and, uh, and then went um, uh, uh, to the food science department with a guy named Dr. Martin Lowe and some of his students, and we just started to experiment and, and play, and, and the rest is uh, this is This is great. So I just want to remind people that what Ethan's referring to is the Maryland Industrial Partnership Program, where it allows someone like an entrepreneur like Ethan Brown to work with a faculty member to refine their idea, and which is what he did through the MIPS program, which is an outstanding program. So how do you go from that scientific understanding, Ethan, to now founding and starting Beyond Meat? You know, how do you do that? That's the next step. Yeah, I think, I think one thing that is, is really important in business is to just, and then people say this all the time, and it's really true, but it's often overlooked, is you know, have an obsession with your, with your customer and your consumer. And so I understood at, at this point that scientifically it was possible, and, and you know, thank, thank goodness we have a lot of great scientists and engineers who are much better than I am at what they do. Um, and, and so we have now over 200 working here. Uh, um, but at the time, it was the, the kind of academic team we put together was both the University of Maryland and the University of Missouri. Uh, and, and then we went to customers. And we said, kind of, what do you, what, how do you think about, what do you think about this product? Are we making progress? And they would come to the lab at College Park, and uh, Whole Foods would come. And I'd say, what do you guys think of this version? And you just get obsessed with, like, how do I deliver to the consumer something that, to the human century experience, is indistinguishable from animal protein? And then you also remain uh, cognizant of the fact that you have miles to go. You know, don't think you're done, you know, because we weren't done. We're not done today. We have to keep making this product better so that it is someday completely indistinguishable, so that the most hardcore carnivore that ever existed would be like, I can't tell you the difference. Like that will be the day that we will finally rest. <laughs> impressive, impressive goals. So um, I can see that most of your, some of your motivation is motivated, motivated by sustainability um, yeah. and also uh, low impact on our uh, cows and other animals. So as you know, at Maryland, um, fearless ideas, a grand challenge is demand, fearless ideas like the ones that you've been tackling. And as you know, we've been very supportive of really creating and focusing on the climate. So I announced at my inauguration Absolutely. that in 2025, the entire campus will be net carbon neutral. And I know that Beyond Meat has a number of goals as well as it relates to sustainability. Maybe you can share us your other philosophy in support of the sustainable planet going forward. Yeah, I just uh, well, I want to just take one more moment. I think we, when we talked recently, we discussed this, how proud I am of the university and of you for doing that. Um, I, in fact, I was on the phone with my dad over the weekend, and I mentioned that and just how we're both just 
thought it spoke volumes about what this institution stands for. So just, you know, and, and the, the specific conversation we had was a lot of people will set those goals, but they set them way out. Right. You know, like when I'll be retired, all that stuff. <laughs> right. like, you know, but you said no, 2025. Right. Absolutely. Around the corner. And that takes bold leadership, and that, that's going to make all the difference for us uh, as a university and leading the world in, in tackling tackling these these problems. So, um, you know, at Beyond Meat, it's it's we our sustainability. You know, it, it's we, we wear it on our sleeve in the sense of, you know, when you have a burger that's been produced by Beyond Meat, it has ninety f- fewer ninety percent fewer emissions than than greenhouse gas emissions than maybe twenty burger that comes from beef. So, a regular beef burger. Right. It uses 93 percent less land. And so think about that just for a second. If you can grow the same amount of, you know, quote, burgers on uh, on 93 percent less land, you get a lot more land in the world. All of a sudden you can do other things, with, including sequester carbon and things of that nature. Um, and then we think about natural resources. We think about the energy. We use about half the energy and 99 percent less water. So it's it's a winner from an environment perspective. But we can't rest there. We have to also make sure that it absolutely delights and satiates everybody in terms of consuming it. Like, you know, people uh, uh, will do it once for the environment, but you need to create something that they're going to love to eat. And so the analogy that I always think about, not from a consumption perspective, but a use perspective, is this thing right here. Like, nobody had to denigrate the landline to make this popular. No one had to say, you know, the landline's destroying the world or anything negative. It's just like, let's create a better piece of technology. Right. And that's the easiest way to affect change in this regard is let's create a piece of meat that people love to eat, that has health benefits for them in terms of, you know, uh, I don't know if you unfortunately were watching my Lakers last night, but uh, Chris Paul, Chris Paul is just amazing, right? He's 36 and and, uh, and he's, he's all plant-based and he, he will regularly attribute his longevity to it, right? And so let's create products and give people advantages they didn't have before. Uh, he's a big spokesman for us and, and very authentic in that regard. And they'll, they'll come to the product, you know, and I think that's the best way to do this. Uh, that's, that's fascinating, that's great. I didn't know he was, uh, is he a spokesperson for uh, Beyond Meat? Yes. He's an early investor. Chris is great. He's an early investor and very. So when he he was uh, in the 2020 All Star Games, so at that point he'd been in the league 14 years, I think. He caught an alley oop dunk from Russell Westbrook, and and they, you know he's six one maybe. And they said like, well, you know, how are you doing that at, at this many years in the league? And he said, I'll go on plant based. He said there'll be times after practice where I forget to ice because the inflammation in my body. And that's the big thing sure. about plant based eating is it it really helps to tame the inflammation in your body. Huh. And he, he was experiencing that firsthand. That's great. Thank, thank you for sharing that story. So what, yeah. what's next for you? What's next for Beyond Meat? Yeah, I mean, we are focused very much on international expansion. So, uh, you know, we're looking, uh, we're making investments in the EU in terms of facilities and personnel. We're making advanced, uh, investments in China, um, where uh, we're just set up a new plant in Yajing. Um, and then here in the U.S., uh, you know, continuing to grow our presence in grocery and in QSR. Like any business, or like many businesses rather, COVID has been difficult uh, on us from a food service perspective because a lot of restaurants closed down. They're now reopening, and that's really good for our business, so we're excited about that. That's outstanding. So uh, we've come to the point in our program, Ethan, where, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, but we have some questions that have come in uh, either through the chat of the Zoom uh, that we would love to have you um, hear some of those questions, if you don't mind. Sure. So yeah, I'm going to uh, just go through a, a few list of questions. So a lot of young businesses fail. What does it take to succeed? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And, and, and one of the things, you know, we're, we just raised all this capital on the market. And, and, and not only do most businesses fail, but most acquisitions actually fail, most yeah. mergers. And so we've been looking around that area, and it's just high, it's a high-risk game. Um, you know, it's crazy advice. And... I mean, first of all, so when I when I look at that question, you know, I would I would go to the entrepreneur class that I was taking, um, and they'd always bring back people who were like wildly successful, you know, and then I'd be like, well, I want to see the person that's like living in their mom's basement because I've done that, you know, after failing, you know, and 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 you got to be willing to get through that, you know, so you got you got to be willing to fail, have everything kind of the pieces fall apart and pick them all back up again. And, and you know, you emerge stronger. I mean, you really do. Failure is a masterful teacher. It, it, your nervous system is completely ready to listen, you know, because uh, and so um, I think you have to be, be willing to fail, um, be willing to see that you'll be successful after failure. Um, and this is crazy. You got to take away the safety net because things get really hard. And if you have a safety net, you might take it. 
and then you never know what's going to happen. Right. And so like I, at some point I had no safety net. I had sold, you know, the, the house that I had, I, you know, run through it. Like you always say, I'm not going to, I'm never going to touch this savings, but then you touch it. You know, I'm, I'm never going to empty my 401k and then you empty it. You know, it's like, but you just become more determined. And then you're really surprised at what you will do to make something successful. You know, just how hard you will work. I spent so many mornings at BWI in the freezing cold, carrying around, you know, like, like four in the morning, you know, trying to get, catch a flight out to Missouri, carrying around huge bags of, of you know, plant-based chicken. You know, it, I put it once up in the Southwest bin above me and it, it, the bag opened and it fell down. And the steward's like, there's chicken falling. I'm like, no, it's plant-based chicken. I didn't help clarify the situation. <laughs> you know, like, so you go to great lengths to once you put everything in it. <laughs> yeah. Another great story. Um, so, you know, going forward, what do you think right now in terms of acceptance of your products? What are some of the biggest barriers in terms of the public's acceptance of your products? I think there's two things, uh, three. Uh, so one is around um, continuing to improve uh, the century experience, but also understanding the consumer's understanding of that, you know, that they, they need to be confident when they bite into one of our burgers, it's going to taste great. And we've gotten there where it is tasting great, but we have to educate because there's a long history of these types of products where the outcomes have not been all that good. Right. But we've brought the level of investment in that you need to bring in. We've, we, we've really, I think done the work to, to get it to the point where it tastes great. Um, but we always have to improve it. We have to keep improving. So it's indistinguishable. I think the second, um, is a cultural issue. Um, and it's, it's, it's changed even in the last decade, I've watched this change, but it's still there a little bit. You know, uh, it, it, there's been a long standing for, for centuries sort of misconception that plant-based protein is somehow inferior to animal protein. That if you're going to be, you know, strong and robust and, and, and vital, you, you should be consuming animal protein. That's just how we were raised. Right. And, uh, and that's just, that's sort of a factual in the sense that like it's what you want is amino acids and minerals and vitamins. If they're combined in the right way in a burger that's plant-based, it's actually better for you because you can keep out some of the things that, that are, you gotta think about what a muscle is. A muscle's not there for us to consume it per se, it's there for the animal to do work. And so there are components of that muscle that aren't necessarily good for you to be consuming all the time. We can keep those out. So the second is just around helping people understand that you can flourish on a plant-based diet and be robust. And I think the third is cost. We've got to continue to drive the cost structure of our products to the point where they're under that of animal protein so that we can underprice animal protein. If you get taste right, you deliver the health message, and then you drop the price below that of animal protein, it becomes an unusual consumer that says, you know, tastes just like it's better for me, it's, it's cost less, I'm still not going to eat it. You know, that gets into sort of fringe territory. That's fascinating. So, so you've got those three things that you want to focus on. I think that's great. Um, so who are your competitors that are in the market that you're willing to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, we, we have a lot of competition um, and it's come on pretty strong, but I think, you know, there's the, Silicon Valley and, and Wall Street always does this where, you know, they, they see a trend, they think, and then they overinvest, right? And so I think you're seeing some of that right now where people are getting investment in this space and coming in or, or companies that maybe think it's going to be easier than it is. You know, Nestle comes in, Tyson comes in, Smithfield comes in. So the incumbents have come in and we have startups from there's like a small, very insignificant liberal arts school. Uh, what is it, Stanford University? Uh, <laughs> yeah, little, I, I, a little small liberal arts school, yes. I'm California, I think it's in California. <laughs> I think it is. Anyway, so they, they got, they got, a, they got a, the program that launched out of there called Impossible Foods. Uh, and uh, I'm just kidding. It's a, great, it's a good company. It's a very good company, <laughs> and they're doing good things. Um, but uh, so they're a competitor of ours. Different approach, though. We're, GM, we're, we're non-GMO, and they're GMO. Um, and so, uh, so we're... we're um, uh, you know, we've got a lot of competition, but, you know, two years in, a lot of investment comes in. What's the number? Who's the number one brand in retail? It's Beyond Meat. Who's the number one uh, brand in food service? It's Beyond Meat. And so we, we, we wow. tend to keep it that way, but we have to keep fighting. Yeah. Impressive. Impressive. Thank you. So another question has come in. What is What value has Beyond Meat introduced to the marketplace? Yeah, I think it's this idea that I think the one thing that we want, you always have to be very uh, honest with yourself and humble in the sense of like, we just happened to do this at the right time. The consumer was was coming at this in a way that uh, gave us uh, some strength that, that, that was really extraordinary. Um, uh, and so, so, but there's a quote from Ray Kroc, who founded McDonald's, which is, uh, it's one, you know, it's, uh, it's one thing to uh, be in the lead. It's another thing to do something about it. Right. And so we're now, so we've got the lead position. What are we going to do about it? Right. And so we have to keep conveying value to the consumer and that value is around 
the sensory experience, you know, that you can have a piece of plant-based meat that actually really satisfies and, 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 and evokes that sense of the barbecue you had as a kid, the burgers, you know, that your, your mom or dad was cooking, um, and, uh, and then deliver the health proposition. You know, it's really about health. Uh, you know, consumers will do a lot in the environment, but they'll do it more quickly for their own health. And so we got to deliver on the health and third cost. So you know, let's let's get taste right. Let's get the health uh, message clear across, and let's drop the price below that amount of protein. That's what we propose to the consumer as a as a as a, as a value. Yeah, thank you. So the, another question has come in. What has been the hardest part of being an entrepreneur in the food space, and how have you overcome that? And as an antidote. Um, this person says, by the way, your hot Italian sausages are the best, way better than real meat. <laughs> oh, thank you. There we go. Thank you. That's very sweet. Thank you. I like that a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I think the trickiest thing in, in the entrepreneur space that I'm in with technology and food is, uh, you know, you got to, you can, everyone asks the question, uh, what can science do? But you have to ask a, a second question, too, which is what should science do? And so, you know, the consumer is very conservative about what they're willing to put in their mouth, right? And so we can use all the high science we want, but at the end of the day, they have to be recognizable ingredients, right? And so we have stayed away from genetic modification. We have stayed away from um, uh, bioengineering uh, uh, food. We believe everything you need is already in nature. We just have to work hard to find it and then present it in the right way. So, like, for example, our system of uh, creating uh, uh, the underlying structure of muscle. It, let's say you find uh, protein in plants in a form that's like this, I'm just using my hands like a TP, and, and then you, you you break them and reset them into the form of muscle structure. So it's not changing the biology of it, it's simply changing the structure of it. So we have to take approaches like that uh, because consumers don't want too much technology in their food. They want it to be natural. And so that walking that fine line has been been a challenge for us. And I think one we've handled uh, so far up in, a, uh, in a decent way. So um, you and I have talked about our sort of both our love for the sport of basketball uh, in yeah. our last meeting. And yeah. uh, this this person asked the question, um, why, why do you have a love of basketball and why do you have this? Um, you work with a lot of athletes. Why is that? Why do you do that? Well, it gets, it gets back to Maryland too. I mean, this is very. I mean, this is just like the core of, of who I am. I, 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 you, if you if you had an opportunity to be a very young person and go into what was then Cole Field House and watch a player named Len Bias play, you you, you can't help but fall in love with the game. Right. And so that that was what happened for me. I mean, I just I just and I've been such a terrible fan ever since. Um, but. Uh, athletes are important because of that second challenge that I was talking about with respect to. Um, the misconception about plant-based protein, you know, that, that somehow, you know, th there was a great Bud Light ad that was done about a decade ago where there's a guy in the, in the um, parking lot, I think of uh, uh, where were the um, uh, Eagles play um, in Philly. And, uh, and he's cooking what he's calling a quinoa burger, but he's mispronouncing it. It's called quinoa, he's butchering the name. He is desperate to tell all the boys around him that this is my girlfriend's burger. It's not mine. This is not mine. It's my, it's my girlfriend's, right? And so there's this sort of dis, you know, discriminatory view about the plant protein that, that, that a real athlete wouldn't use it. But the irony is that a real athlete does use it and they perform better as a result. And so we wanted to hammer that thing home, get rid of that bias, right? And, and help educate people that like, if you really want to perform at a high level, plant-based can help you get there. Nice, nice. Uh, another question, uh, the person asks, how have things changed since your IPO? As a CEO, has it become easier or now more challenging? It definitely has become harder, but it gave us a great platform to, to educate the public about the brand um, that, I, that I wouldn't, you know, I, I really am happy we did it from, from that perspective. I think the challenge is one you hear often around that question, which is it, it, there's a relentless short-term focus in results uh, in terms of earnings. And if you're trying to build a business for the long term where, okay, this is a great, I think, example, COVID hits, it's transitory. Uh, we know that it's going to lift at some point. Uh, what does that have to do with the effects of the outcome of our business in five years? Nothing, right? And so uh, to get my uh, income statement to, to, to true up during that period, should I just stop all investment? You know, should I stop hiring? Should I stop doing all these things? No, I'm going to keep doing it. But the street is saying, you know, you got to deliver these short-term results. 
you just you have to just put on uh, you know, blinders and just focus on what's the five-year outcome I'm trying to get to, not listen to that noise, because otherwise, if you try to manage your business to the street, you'll be left holding the bag. And so that's been the biggest challenge. Wow, interesting. So um, someone asks, uh, can you explain the photos that are to the, over the, your left shoulder? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and why are they up? <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. That's, that's, that, that's uh, our farm in Maryland. And uh, as I mentioned, my, my dad, um, you know, uh, is an entrepreneur himself and was a, did, did, when he was teaching in Maryland, which was for decades, um, uh, he, him, he didn't want to be in the city, um, even though we lived in Washington, D.C. and in Hyattsville. Um, he liked being out in the countryside. And so he would take us up there all the time. And over time, he started a business there, which is Holstein Cattle, a, a dairy business. And so that really informed a lot of my love of the outdoors and agriculture and everything else. And so I just, I like to keep it there. Nice, nice. Right. Always, always, always that strong connection back to the state of Maryland. I love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So another question has come in. Um, did you have a mentor or coach that helped you during your journey? I did. I've been very fortunate. There's too many to mention, but I've had a great board, or an amazing board, um, including uh, someone who uh, is uh, from, from Maryland or lives in Maryland now for decades, uh, Seth Goldman, who's the founder of Honest Tea That's out of Bethesda. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great guy. Yeah. Um, really, I think I talked to him yeah, yesterday, but we talk all the time. Um, and uh, and I mean, so many people on my board. Ray Lane uh, is the earliest uh, institutional investor I had. He was the president of Oracle, and uh, and he's really a legend in, in, in Silicon Valley around investing. And, and uh, he's been a great mentor for me over the last uh, almost dozen years now. Um, uh, he, you know, he, he came and invested when this was just in the lab and he and I have stayed very close. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, can you address the processed component and health issues? I love the product, but keep reading about the processing issues and negative health effects. So I think when you're challenging a, a very large, uh, uh, incumbent industry, uh, you have to be prepared um, for pushback. Yeah. And, and so um, there are trigger words that people will use like process, right? But if you actually look up process in the dictionary, it's a series of steps to a desired outcome. So it's a neutral word, right? And I think we have to take a step back from that and say, okay, what is the process that we're running? And it's taking basically protein directly from plants and running it through heating, cooling, and pressure, which resets the bonds and gives you that muscle structure versus running all that plant material through an animal and industrial agriculture. Like you, you, most people can raise their hand if they look at both processes. I'd like the one that starts with and ends with plants. Um, so there's, there's that. Um, but we wanted to do more on the health side than just, you know, for say our products are healthy and point to studies around plant-based eating versus plant-based meat. So we actually started doing studies, and I was joking about Stanford earlier, uh, with Stanford uh, on, um, at Stanford Medical, uh, on the health implications of our products. Yeah. And this, we just finished the uh, most recent one probably six, eight months ago. Uh, and the results were, were terrific. I mean, they were, you know, just, and we don't have any control on the outcome. Right? Sure, that, that sure. right. So, uh, uh, so, but do you, how does that get out to the media? How does that get out to the general consumer when you have those yeah. studies that come back really so favorably? Yeah, so we, we do at that point, once they're out, they go, first of all, they're published in peer reviewed journals, and then we, then we, we, we go ahead and market heavily around that. Uh, and then we give it talking points to, to all of our, like a guy like Chris Paul will get them and represent us. But the results were fantastic in the sense of LDL cholesterol, which is a bad cholesterol, drops statistically and clinically significant levels. And then TMAO, which is a close associated with heart disease, also drops significantly. And so we'll keep doing those studies, whether with young people and athletes or older people who have certain conditions, heart disease disease, et cetera, because we understand that the, the science behind it is that this will, it's a cleaner source of protein for your body that will confer benefits. We just have to get out there and build the data around it. Yeah. Excellent. Um, another question, what was the largest hiccup or setback while growing beyond meat? And how did you deal with it or, or with rejection and or failure? Yeah, we've had all of those. Um, I think it's back to the earlier thing where you, you know, you're attached to your passion, you're, you remove your safety net, um, uh, and, uh, and you just keep working you know, every day. You, you, you just get, if you fail, you just get up and do it again. We have failed. We failed in a lot of ways. We went into food service too early back in like 2013, and, and because I was having success at campuses and was having success 
at um, like uh, mainline hospitals up in the Philly area and things like that. I thought I, I could skip a lot of the spend that goes into retail brand and just go into food service. So I hired a pretty big food service team, hired people away from big poultry companies and things like that. And unfortunately, it didn't work. And that was an awful lesson for me because I had to let go of staff, retrench, go into retail. And uh, But as long as you keep having that true north and you just keep fighting in that direction, you'll get through that. Through that. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a little long question. Uh, just bear with me. What do you think about dealing with wanted versus needed demands? With the success of Beyond Meat, how will you help the society move from wanted but not needed non-sustainable products? It is easy to sell wanted products, while market failure is very common to address needed products. It's a very interesting perspective. Great question. It sounds like a mix between a philosophy and economics. Uh, <laughs> Major. <laughs> and, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. I, you know, and I don't know the answer to that. I mean, okay. that's a that's but that's a that's a good question. I think the way to think about it is is how do you incentivize consumers to purchase more of what's good for them and less of what's not? And and we haven't really done a great job as they know market failure in, in working that one out. Yeah. Thank but, you. So, um, what do you suggest for ways the legacy livestock industry? can improve some of their practices? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. And it, I think it's important to emphasize that, you know, this is in, this, on either side of that farm, the people who, who, who raise cattle. And uh, and so we've never taken any kind of adversarial approach toward those folks who are some of the hardest working in, in country. Um, and so what I, what I, what, what, what does bother me a little bit is there's this effort within media to pitch us against, you know, cattle farmers and things of that nature. And of course, there's some inherent, you know, conflict there for sure. But um, to me, if you look at the digital um, revolution that happened in our in our economy over the last 30 years, a lot of places got really rich, Silicon Valley, Tech Corridor or in Virginia or in, in Boston, places like that, rural America largely got left out. You know, I mean, there's just not a lot of development that went on as a result of, of that. And even now, it's like you know, there's an article in the Times this weekend about you know, warehouses going up in the fields around uh, in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania. But there hasn't, there wasn't that kind of wealth generation. And this is a huge step change in productivity when you talk about 93% less land, 99% of water, et cetera. So it's an opportunity for farmers to actually make more, not less money. Now, they might not be able to make it through the same methods. Right. But if they have land and they and they they have an inkling around you know producing for example you know uh, crops that go into our system versus into the mouth of an animal they can make more money because you're going to spend I mean, it's, it's a very intuitive thought that are you going to make more money selling something that goes into a consumer's mouth or something that goes into an animal's mouth and you're going to make more money on the, what goes into a consumer's mouth and not all land is suitable for that but a lot of it is and let's worry about that first before we get into the sort of extreme examples of land we can't use Oh, that's fascinating. And so have you have you tried to advocate and share those thoughts with farmers about their choices? Yes, yes we have. And I've, I've met with like feed associations and I met with a cattleman up in uh, up in uh, uh, Ontario once before one of our launches, actually with McDonald's um, up there. Uh, and, you know, something that just now that we're on the topic together, I should reach back out to the Maryland uh, ag, ag program on that. What we should do is get a study with the business school. Yes. Like, but actually, what are the economic that for, for farmers? Uh, and I think that's a great, excellent idea to partner there. I think uh, we'll, we'll try to, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to them myself now that you said that. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. So here's another interesting question for you. Um, and, and I really think it reflects what you're doing. Um, you are tackling some of the biggest problems facing the world with Beyond Meat. If you weren't so consumed with your current business, what other problems would you be tackling? Well, I've always thought about, um, in a very literal sense, like you know, I was I was in I was in uh, Van Munching Hall when I was talking to my dad about this uh, forever ago. Now, he asked me sort of what is the biggest problem in the world, and because I was talking about what I should do in my career, and I thought like, in a literal sense, like it's got to be climate because right. the climate's the last right. So that's what I went and worked on. Um, but. Uh, but there's so many issues right now in the society. The the uh, inequities in our culture are just getting more extreme. I'd probably work on that. If I somehow someone said you, you no longer allowed to work on this, I'd work on that. Yeah. They're 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 scary. We gotta get we gotta get on. You know, I think I agree. You know, 2020 to me is a seminal year 
in the history of the human race. And, um, and we really wrestled with multiple pandemics, uh, obviously yeah. the virus, but social injustice and racial injustice, and even the uncertainty yeah. in our elections. Um, yeah. uh, and I agree, those things to focus on and how we can be a better society are at the front of some of the things that we want to do at the University of Maryland so that we'll be an exemplar uh, to our well, community. It's terrific. I mean, I, 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 I love this generation that's coming up um, for all those reasons of the marching that's going on around race, gender, uh, there's a climate, there's, there's, there's a feeling that they're just not going to accept what we have dealt with before. Yeah. And I, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple more questions, and I think we're close to wrapping it up. Uh, when you started Beyond Meat, the category was a very niche kind of category. Today, who is your consumer, and do you feel that you've attained a mainstream position? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so it, it definitely started uh, niche, and I would say in the main, it still is a niche position uh, if you just statistically uh, look at it. But um, here's what's fascinating to me is if you look at Kroger, which is the nation's largest grocer, and this data is a couple summers ago, uh, I need to refresh it, but 93% um, of the people that are putting uh, Beyond Meat in their cart are also putting animal protein in their cart. And so we're getting what we call the flexitarian, which is a large percentage of the US population, people that are willing to have both animal and plant protein uh, in forms of meat. And so um, it's, it's rapidly becoming something that's gonna be mainstream. The unlock to make it fully mainstream is to continue to improve the taste, uh, continue to drive home the health message so people are intrinsically motivated to get it and then drop the price below animal protein. You do that, I think it becomes the default uh, purchase versus, versus you know, uh, an ex exception or alternative. Yeah. Are uh, fish like salmon and sardines, yeah. which provide plenty of dietary benefits, Replaceable with plant-based ingredients? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's all the same idea. I mean, and I mean, history. If you want to know a lot about this subject of meat and and this whole relationship we have with meat, just all you got to do is start reading about evolution. I mean, we, we came from fish, right? So it's like uh, the the body is the same. I mean, the, the one one point that really fascinates me about this is that bilateral symmetry, where if you look at the body of a fish and the body of a human, you know we've arms like this on each side, the fins on each side, you know, the eyes, et cetera, some fish have different, but most of them. So this, there's this commonality of life uh, that exists in biology right. and it exists in fish and exists in terrestrial animals as well. So it's, it's all doable, yeah. All right, last two questions. Um, looking back on the past 12 years, um, what has been in your mind your most significant accomplishment that you're most proud of? Wow. I'd have to think about that. Um, I think it's his relationship with these QSR partners, like being able to take my kids like this weekend. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like uh, this weekend I went to, in terms of just the amount of Beyond Meat I consume, <laughs> like, like, I went to Dunkin' and I got breakfast sauce with my son because he had a tournament. So you know well what this is like. You were doing the soccer. You know, so you're waiting between games and right. you got to get something to eat. We went to Dunkin', we went to Del Taco out here and got a nice burrito with Beyond Meat, and then we finished up the day at Carl's with a nice burger. Like, I was proud of that, you know? Like, not, I mean, that, not that particular moment, but I'm proud to be able to do that. Sure. You know, to be, go in and say, like, if you have a problem in the world that you're facing, you can if you work hard enough and get lucky enough, you can have an impact. That's a really, really good way to end, but I'm not gonna let it end there. I'm gonna go back to our love of basketball. And I'm going to ask you who's going to win the NBA championship. <laughs> I want to talk to you about this. I'll talk with you. So we, we might have to have another four or five hours. Okay? So, so. <laughs> this is Sticks last night. Sticks hit a three. Uh, I know. I saw that. That was just great. You know, the Lakers look terrible. Uh, even Snoop was, was, was tweeting about how bad they look and, and uh, telling us saying the Clippers are better now. And oh, it's just a mess. Um, so, you know, the Nets are obviously the favorite. And, and, uh, but the NBA's got a problem. I mean, that, that, that's tough that that happened. That they got all three of those guys. You got, you know, KD, 42 points. You got Kyrie Irving, 39. James Harden puts in a pedestrian 23. You know, it's, it's like, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah it's, so. it's this whole building, uh, you know, building the, these elite teams. I don't know what you call them, super teams in some sense, with great, yeah. great, you know, stars on all on one team getting along. And uh, yeah. so... Yeah. 
Well, what do you uh, think? I, still, I still hope the Lakers, but what do you think? Uh, I think you're right, the Nets. Uh, you know, of course, if my Golden State Warriors were there, I would have pushed push for them. But they, they've got another year to, to get a couple more players. <laughs> yeah. Back. Steph Curry, what Steph Curry is doing right now is unbelievable. It is truly unbelievable. Like, like he had a crazy career. Oh my God, this year. Amazing. But then, but then talk about Oakland for one second. I know we'll yeah. get off the subject. But Tim Lillard going from one to 10. He has one, he was one for 10 in the previous playoff game. He had 12 threes last night. Really? He had 12. Wow. Yeah, so he broke the the record of a playoff game. Oh, right. That's okay. There was 11 by Steph, I think. Exactly. exactly. That Oakland pride right there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, Ethan. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, Ethan, first of all, let me just say thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share your thoughts about entrepreneur entrepreneurship with our Terps and our broader audience that are here virtually. It's been personally my pleasure to speak with you in this virtual session. Uh, to all the students and alumni and community members watching, thank you for joining us and for all of your great questions that I think we got through a lot of them. And we're really grateful for you submitting them. I can see that Ethan Brown brought a lot of excitement. And you want to learn more about how he got to where he got, but we're grateful that he's a, a great Terp and he's doing so well. There are another two full days of our conference programming that I know you all will enjoy. So visit our Alumni Association website for more information. And let's never forget to always say, Go Terps!